Hello, St. Peter's. Welcome back for another edition of our chapter book series. Last week, we finished Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing with Judy Bloom. Boy, did that have a surprise ending. Fudge sure can get into some trouble. But my friends are back to try something a little bit different. We have Ralph, Magic Monkey, Daisy, and of course, Joy is here with her jar of joy so we can spread some joy at the end. But first, we are excited to share with you our next book. Now this one is going to ask you for your help to try to solve the mysteries. This is Encyclopedia Brown Sets the Case by Donald J. Sobel. Now Encyclopedia Brown is a boy detective who helps their town solve many cases. So what it's going to do, we're gonna read about each case. At the end, it's going to ask if you know who did it. And then we get to go to the back of the book and check and see if we were right with the clues that they gave us. So we're gonna try two or three each week as we go through this book and see if we can be good detectives, just like Encyclopedia Brown. All right, you ready? Here we go. Encyclopedia Brown sets the pace by Donald J. Sobel. Our first case, the case of the supermarket shopper. So make sure you listen carefully because there could be clues at any time. You ready? In every city and town across America, crime was a serious problem, except in Idaville. There, the forces of law and order were in control. Crooks knew better than to try anything. If they did, they were certain to be caught. No one, child or grown up, got away with breaking the law in Idaville. How did Idaville do it? Only three persons knew, and they weren't telling. Apart from doing in Crooks, Idaville was like most seaside towns. It had lovely beaches, three movie theaters, and two delicatessens. It had churches, a synagogue, and four banks. The chief of police was Mr. Brown. People called him a genius, but he knew better. True, he was an excellent police chief, and his officers were honest and brave. But the real genius behind the town's war on crime was Chief Brown's only child, 10-year-old Encyclopedia, America's Sherlock Holmes in sneakers. Whenever Chief Brown came up against a mystery he could not solve, he took the proper action. He drove home. At the dinner table, he went over the facts with Encyclopedia before dessert. Encyclopedia had the case solved. Chief Brown wanted the president to proclaim Encyclopedia a national treasure. He hated keeping his son undercover, but whom could he tell? Who would believe him? Who would believe that the mastermind behind Idaville's amazing police record was still outgrowing his pants? So Chief Brown, said not a word to anyone, and neither, of course, did Mrs. Brown. For his part, Encyclopedia never mentioned the help he gave his father. He didn't want to seem better than other fifth graders. But there was nothing he could do about his nickname. No one except his parents and his teachers called him by his real name, Leroy. Everyone else called him Encyclopedia. An encyclopedia is a book or a set of books filled with facts from A to Z, so, so was Encyclopedia's head. He had read more books than anyone in Idaville. His pals claimed he was more fun than the library. He could take them on fishing trips. At the dinner table Saturday evening, Chief Brown picked at his roast beef. Encyclopedia and his mother waited. They knew the sign. A case had him baffled. At last, Chief Brown put down his fork. Hmm. A painting by Ignacio Saraco was stolen Friday night from the home of William Quinn. Encyclopedia let out a whistle. <whistles> Ignacio Saraco was a minor 15th century artist. Even so, any painting by him was worth thousands of dollars today. Why not go over the case with Leroy, dear? Mrs. Brown suggested quietly. He's never failed you. Chief Brown sighed heavily. 
All right, but I don't have a single clue. He put down his fork and told Encyclopedia everything he had learned about the theft of the painting. Mr. Quinn lived in a small house on Suncrest Sun Drive. The Sirocco painting had hung over the fireplace for 20 years. Friday morning, Mrs. Quinn had left for Glen City to visit her mother, leaving Mr. Quinn alone. In the afternoon, he invited three friends, Edgar Trad, Tom Hauser, and Murray Finkelstein, to come over and play checkers. They played for three hours. Then, at six o'clock, Mr. Quinn called a halt. He had to go to, Mo to Maury's supermarket on Clearview Avenue, a five-minute drive away. His wife had asked him to buy four rolls of paper towels before she returned home. I've shopped, I've shopped at that supermarket, Mrs. Brown interrupted. It's so hard to pay unless you use the speed checkout counter, but then you must have no more than 10 purchases. I remember you're complaining about the crowds, Chief Brown said. You quit shopping there because the lines at the five regular checkout counters were so long. Oh, they ought to put in two more speed counters, Mrs. Brown said wistfully. Chief Brown nodded sympathetically and went on with the case. Mr. Quinn's three friends had asked him to buy small items for when, while he was at the supermarket. Mr. Finkelstein wanted two loaves of rye bread. Mr. Hauser wanted four tubes of glad brim toothpaste, and Mr. Trad wanted a brown whisk broom. Mr. Quinn agreed to shop for them. Since they lived on the same block, it was no bother. While he was at the supermarket, one of the three might have sneaked back into the house, said Mrs. Brown. Possibly, replied Chief Brown. The house was empty for an hour. The back door had been forced and the painting was missing when he returned from the supermarket. Do his friends have alibis? Mrs. Brown asked. Each of them can account for his time while Mr. Quinn was shopping, answered Chief Brown. Mr. Finkelstein said he was alone in his garage repairing a rake. Mr. Hauser said he was in his backyard tending his flowers. Mr. Trad said he spent about an hour reading in his study. None of them, however, had a witness. Hmm. Then one of them must be the thief asserted Mrs. Brown. They were the only ones who knew that Mr. Quinn was at the supermarket. Not so, Chief Brown replied. Any number of people may have noticed Mr. Quinn driving from his house and others who knew him might have seen him at the supermarket. We do give us a little picture here. The outside of their house, somebody coming up to get the painting. Hmm. Chief Brown leaned back in his chair Besides, he continued, Mr. Quinn told me that he greeted two friends by the soup shelves. They were Winnie Dowling, who lives next door, and Clyde Dennison, who lives two blocks away. Put them on the list of suspects. Don't, but don't forget, dear, said Mrs. Brown. Only Mr. Trad, Mr. Finkelstein, and Mr. Hauser knew that Mrs. Quinn was in Glen City for the day. Only they knew that the house would be empty while Mr. Quinn shopped. Not so again, disagreed Chief Brown. Mrs. Quinn goes to visit her mother every Friday morning. She always returns about the same hour, 10 o'clock at night. I expect many people are familiar with her trips. Oh, then anyone in the neighborhood could easily be the thief, Mrs. Brown said hopelessly. And anyone who was in the supermarket Friday evening, added Chief Brown. Mrs. Brown seemed ready to give up. She looked at Encyclopedia for help. With so little to work on, could he solve this mystery? The boy detective had closed his eyes. He always closed his eyes when he did his deepest thinking. Suddenly his eyes opened. He asked one question. Usually he needed but one question to solve the most puzzling case. In what order, Dad, did the three friends ask Mr. Quinn to shop for them at the supermarket? Chief Brown drew a small notebook from his breast pocket. He flipped the pages. Here it is. Mr. Trad asked first, then Mr. Finkelstein, and then Mr. Hauser. Never before had Mrs. Brown appeared disappointed in Encyclopedia's question. 
She was disappointed now, however. How can the order be important, Leroy? She asked. You can't accuse one of the three men because he wanted Mr. Quinn to do a bit of shopping for him. Why, I shop for my friends frequently. But no one robbed our house, Mom, replied Encyclopedia. The key to the theft of the painting is what Mr. Quinn did at the supermarket. Chief Brown leaned forward in his chair, suddenly alert and interested. Leroy, he said, if I had a suspect, I could put a round-the-clock tail on him. He'd be bound to lead us to the painting sooner or later. He wouldn't have time to sell the painting, said Encyclopedia. It's probably still in his house. Oh, for heaven's sake, Leroy, who is it? exclaimed Mrs. Brown. Encyclopedia finished buttering a roll. The house to search belongs to... Who was the thief? Do you know? Hmm. Do you think it was one of those guys? Mr. Trad, Mr. Finkelstein, or Mr. Hauser? Why? Hmm. If you need to go back and listen and see if you can think of some clues, you can do that. We're going to read the answer. How did he figure it out? We have to flip to the back, page 80. All right, here's the answer. If you're not ready for it, go back and re-listen. Make your guess. Here we go. Encyclopedia realized the thief was Mr. Hauser, who made sure Mr. Quinn was away from his house for a good while. Mr. Quinn had to buy four rolls of paper towels, a whisk broom for Mr. Trad, and two loaves of bread for Mrs. Mr. Finkelstein. With only seven purchases, Mr. Quinn could use the speed counter where the limit was 10. So Mr. Hauser asked for four tubes of toothpaste to bring the total to 11 purchases. Therefore, Mr. Quinn had to wait in one of the long lines at the regular checkout counters, delaying his return home by 15 or 20 minutes. The painting was found hidden in Mr. Hauser's attic. Hmm, see, he made him so he couldn't go through the fancy uh, fast checkout. He had to stand in line. Did you guess it? Don't worry if you didn't. That was just a warm up. Let's try another one. The next one is called, ooh, the case of the dinosaur hunter. This sounds fun. Throughout the year, Encyclopedia solved cases for his father at the dinner table. During the summer, he helped the children of the neighborhood as well. When school let out, he opened a detective agency in the garage. Every morning, he hung out his sign, Brown Detective Agency, 13 Rover Avenue, Leroy Brown, President. No case too small, 25 cents per day, plus expenses. The first customer on Monday was Garth Pouncey. He was seven. Have you seen any dinosaurs around here? He asked. Not for 60 million years, replied Encyclopedia. Garth's face fell. I think Bugs Meanie put one over on me, he said. Oh no, not Bugs again, Encyclopedia said, groaning. Bugs Meanie was the leader of a gang of tough older boys. They called themselves the Tigers. They should have called themselves the Razors. They were always getting into scrapes. Garth said, Oh, if there are no dinosaurs around, then the dinosaur hunting license bugs sold me is as phony as pig feathers. He handed Encyclopedia an important looking sheet with a drawing of a Tyrannosaurus and a lot of words. Encyclopedia read, Special permit. This license entitles the holder to pursue, shoot, kill, and remove any of the following dinosaurs. The, design, the dinosaurs that could be hunted lawfully were listed in two columns. Bugs said I could hunt one dinosaur from column A and three from column B unless they were with young, Garth said. I have to clean a dead dinosaur within four days and have it approved by him. He told you he was Idaville's game warden for dinosaurs, guessed Encyclopedia. Garth nodded. You sure know bugs. I've had to stop his fast deals before, Encyclopedia said. He tapped the sheet. 
you can get out of one of you can get one of these fun licenses for nothing by writing to a place in Utah. Garth wailed. Oh, I promised to pay Bugs three dollars for it on Monday. He laid twenty-five cents on the gasoline can beside the detective. Can I hire you to get me out of this mess? <sighs> Tell me how you got into it, Encyclopedia said. Garth explained. Three hours ago, he had hiked, he had biked to Mill Pond to swim. As he crossed the little bridge there, his front wheel struck a rut and he tumbled against Bugs. Bugs's towel dropped into the water and he got awful mad, Garth said. So I lent him my towel for the day. Nice thinking approved encyclopedia. Bug said I was so nice that he'd do me a big favor, said Garth. He'd sell me a dinosaur hunting license and I could pay him on Monday. I grabbed the license and lit out before he changed his mind and pitched me after his towel. I'll take the case, encyclopedia said. I think I can talk Bugs into forgetting about the three dollars. The license is an out and out jip. Oh, get back my towel, too, Garth urged. I pulled it from the dryer as Mom was unloading the machine this morning. If I tell Mom I lost it, she'll have a fit. The Tiger's Clubhouse was an unused tool shed behind Mr. Sweeney's auto body shop. As Encyclopedia approached with Garth, he saw a towel hanging from a branch near the front door. That looks like my towel, Garth said. What if Bugs won't return it? We'll have to prove it's yours, Encyclopedia replied. Garth moaned. How? It's a plain white towel. Their voices brought Bugs to the door of the clubhouse. You should wear a hat, he growled at Encyclopedia. So I know that strange growth on your neck is your head. The detective was used to Bugs' warm and friendly greetings. We've come to return your worthless dinosaur hunting license and get back Garth's towel, he said. Take your mouth, take your mouth south, snapped Bugs. This little kid owes me three dollars. The license doesn't guarantee big game, just the right to hunt. And the towel stays. Garth bit his thumbnail nervously. Bugs sneered at him. I've got a cure for fingernail biters. He held up his fist. I knock out their teeth. Time to leave whispered Garth. I'd like to avoid unnecessary surgery. Not until Bugs agrees to take back the license and return your towel, insisted Encyclopedia. That's my towel, Bugs declared. It fell into Mill Pond this morning and I hung it out to dry. I never even had a chance to use it. Garth bumped your towel into the pond by accident, Encyclopedia said. A lot of kids must have seen it happen. Bugs' lips moved in a cocky grin. Garth said lamely, no one else was around but two of his tigers. Wait, there were some soap flakes on top of mom's dryer. There may be some in the towel. Encyclopedia felt the soft, fluffy white towel searching for soap flakes. There were none. Bugs' grin widened. Go on, Mr. Brains. Prove that isn't my towel. I'll take back the hunting license and he can have the towel. If you can't prove it, I'm going to start dealing out lumps. Save the tough guy talk, Bugs, Encyclopedia advised. I can prove you're lying. So here's a picture. There's the towel. And there they are, Encyclopedia and Garth, and there's Bugs. How can he prove that Bugs is lying? Do you know? Hmm. Think about all the clues. If you need to go back and listen again, go ahead. Make your guess. Okay, let's see how he can prove he's lying. Encyclopedia Brown's a really good listener. Bugs said the towel had fallen into Mill Pond and that he had hung it out to dry. Because it was a plain white towel, he didn't think anyone could prove it wasn't his. Wrong. Encyclopedia could. The detective felt the towel. It was soft and fluffy. 
Only a towel that has been machine dried, like Garth's was, will come out soft and fluffy from the dryer. A towel that has been thoroughly soaked and hung out in the air will feel stiff after it has dried. Thanks to Encyclopedia, Bugs took back the dinosaur license and returned Garth's towel. All he had to do is feel that towel. He's pretty clever. Should we try one more? All right, last one for today. The case of the used firecrackers. Bugs Meanie's heart beat with great desire. It was to get even with Encyclopedia. Bugs hated being outsmarted all the time. He longed to help the boy detective turn things over in his mind by knocking him head over heels. But Bugs never threw a punch. Whenever he felt the urge, he remembered S Sally Kimball. Sally was the prettiest girl in the fifth grade and the best athlete. Moreover, she had proved she could tame the toughest tiger. When they had fought last, Sally had put knuckle dents in Bugs' hide. She had left him lying on his back, stunned and moaning. Deal the cards. Since Sally joined the Brown Detective Agency as a junior partner, Bugs had quit trying to rough up Encyclopedia. He continued to plan his revenge, however, on both of them. You better watch out for bugs, Encyclopedia warned Sally. He hates you as much as he hates me. Sally agreed. If bugs were voted the man of the hour, we'd still have to watch him every minute. Speaking of time, we're due out at the old cattle range in 30 minutes, Encyclopedia said. As they biked to the range, Encyclopedia spoke about the mysterious telephone call he had received last night. The caller said to meet him at the range at 10 this morning by the third telephone pole from the left side of the road, Encyclopedia said. He hinted that the case was important and he'd pay extra. Didn't he say what the case was about? Asked Sally. He said he didn't, he'd tell us when we got there. Strange. Did you recognize his voice? No, answered Encyclopedia. It sounded like he was putting on a fake accent. We'll just have to be careful. The old cattle range was 500 acres of unused land. There was nothing on it but a row of telephone poles, trees, underbrush, snakes, and birds. Encyclopedia and Sally left the paved road. They followed a dirt one that wandered this way and that, its destination lost in the wilderness. After several hundred yards, it turned under the telephone wires. The detectives leaned their bikes against a palmetto palm. The third telephone pole on their left stood in a small clearing. There's no one here, said Sally uneasily. Not quite, remarked Encyclopedia. He pointed to the telephone wires. About a dozen small gray birds were perched directly above them. Sally had stooped over and was picking up something from the ground. A used firecracker, she said with surprise. She looked around. The clearing is covered with them. There must be a few hundred, Encyclopedia observed. Let's go, Sally suggested. Now! Too late, replied Encyclopedia. A police car was coming down the dirt road. It stopped beside their bikes. After a minute, Officer Friedman got out and walked up to the detectives. A bush behind Encyclopedia rustled. Bugs Meanie came leaping out into the clearing. Did you hear it? He asked Officer Friedman. Did you hear it? Officer Friedman shot Bugs a questioning glance. They exploded a firecracker just as you drove up, cried Bugs. You must have been given your position over the radio. I was, admitted Officer Friedman, so I could have missed hearing a firecracker explode. What's this all about, demanded Encyclopedia. Ooh, listen to him, will you, howled Bugs. Mr. Goody Good has finally been caught with the goods. He can't lie his way out of this. Him and Miss Muscles have been setting off firecrackers here all summer. The station received a call this morning, Officer Friedman said. The complaint was that a boy and girl had been exploding firecrackers here and were planning to do it again at 10 o'clock this morning. Bugs drew himself up straight as an Eagle Scout. Fireworks are dangerous and against the law, he announced. Sally whirled on him. What are you doing here? 
I made the call to the police, Bugs boasted. Us tigers uphold the law. Why, one firecracker could set this field blazing. 500 acres of natural beauty up in smoke. Pfft, all because of a couple of smart aleck lawbreakers. That's a lie, you teenage junk heap, snapped Sally. I've got news for you, snarled Bugs. If looks were a crime, you'd have been born in prison. Don't get smart, Sally retorted. It will clash with your brains. Easy does it, you two, Officer Friedman said. He peered at the litter of burned firecrackers. I'll have to report this. Encyclopedia protested. He told Officer Friedman about the telephone call summoning them to the clearing. The policeman continued writing in his notebook. We didn't do anything, insisted Sally. Bugs is trying to get us into trouble. My, how she blabbers on. Pitiful, said Bugs. Think of the headlines tomorrow. Idaville disgraced, son of police chief and female sidekick nabbed in the act. Sally's cheeks reddened in helpless rage. She looked up at the birds perched on the telephone wires. They saw everything. If only birds could talk. They don't have to say a word, remarked Encyclopedia. As usual, Bugs talked too much. What was Bugs's mistake? I'll show you a picture first while you're thinking about it. So what was Bugs's mistake about setting them up where he did? There's the officer and the kids and the telephone wires. If you need to re-listen to figure it out, go ahead. Did you make your guess? All right, let's go see what was Bugs's mistake. How did Encyclopedia figure this one out? Bugs Meanie blamed Encyclopedia and Sally for setting off firecrackers. Actually, he and his tigers had been setting them off all summer. Bugs thought he had everything figured out. Officer Friedman naturally would radio his position when he arrived on the scene so he wouldn't be sure about hearing a firecracker go off, as Bugs said it had. But Bugs had forgotten about the birds. If the detectives had really set off a firecracker, the noise would have frightened the birds away. As Encyclopedia pointed out to Officer Friedman, the birds were sitting peacefully on the wires above them. That's true, right? If you make a loud noise when the birds are around, they all fly away. Wow, so Encyclopedia Brown is really good at listening and he's really good at observing the world around him. He takes in all of the information and thinks it through. That's a pretty good skill. Were you able to crack any of the cases just like Encyclopedia Brown? If not, that's okay. We'll keep working on them. We'll do three more cases next week. All right, that's kind of fun, isn't it? It's a little bit different than the other stories we have been reading. Let's spread some joy. You ready, Joy? Let's see if I can grab her. I don't want to drop you. Let's see how we can spread some joy on these dreary days. It's a little bit rainy today as I record this, but it's the first day it's not snowing, so it's a little bit warmer outside. Let's see what we've got. Oh boy. This is something to do on a Monday. Start a dance party. Dance around. It's easier to dance when I can stand up. So what a great way to work off some energy, to get some energy back. And you know what? I was just telling the kindergartners this morning, some days when you don't, when your body's awake, but you're in school and your brain's kind of tired, you just got to start your day off with a little bit, with a little dancing. And you get your brain going and your body going and makes everybody smile. What a great way to spread joy. Grab who's ever around you, put on some loud music and just dance away. That sounds like fun. And also a good thing to do inside if it's raining or snowing or too cold outside. That's what we have today. Thank you for being detectives with me this week. We'll try it again next week. Until then, keep on dancing and keep spreading your joy.